I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Our guest today is a remarkable student who's only 17, yet has become a national spokesperson against Florida's harmful new Don't Say Gay Bill. In a moment, you will meet LGBTQ student activist Will Larkins. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. You have undoubtedly heard about Florida's controversial new law, the Parental Rights in Education Law, also known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. It outright prohibits or seeks to inhibit public schools from discussing or teaching about sexual orientation and gender identity. And you may have seen how a 17-year-old Florida student, Will Larkins, has spoken out against the harmful effects of this bill before his Florida state legislature, coordinating a walkout of 500 students from his high school with a friend and writing an op-ed that appeared in the New York Times. The Freedom from Religion Foundation was proud to name Will, Will Larkins our Katherine Farringer Student Activist Awardee, which carries a $5,000 scholarship. Will Larkins is a junior at Winter Park High. He's the president and co-founder of the school's Queer Student Union and one of the organizers of the Say Gay Anyway walkout. We're so pleased to meet you, Will. Welcome to Free Thought Matters. Thank you so much for having me. So, so Will, before we get to all these details about this new law and what you've done to fight it, I want to ask how it's been uh, from being going from a regular high school student, and maybe you were already such an activist, to becoming a national figurehead against these kinds of laws. Um, have you found the experience to be empowering? I have found the experience to be empowering. I think one of the biggest wins in this for me in my personal life is the power that I hold within my school now, um, if that makes sense. I think, you know, before, before now, I would go to school dressed however I want and act however I wanted, but I would face people being generally pretty mean to me and stuff. Um, and then administration doing absolutely nothing about it pretty regularly. But after the walkout and after, you know, appearing in so many publications and so many people coming up to me saying, oh, I saw you on Ariana Grande's Instagram mm -hmm. story. I saw you on TV. My mom saw you in like a newspaper, whatever. Um, a lot of that has changed. And uh, the administration has been sort of nice to me in comparison to before. And people have been pretty much leaving me alone. So that's been like the best part about it for me. I feel safe at school for the first time well, that's, in years. That's great, but that's it's kind of uh, startling and sad that you would have felt the opposite before, that you wouldn't have felt safe at school until you kind of became famous about this. And not, all, yeah. and not all students have that advantage too. So that underlines something, doesn't it? Well, exactly. I mean, the reason I even started the Queer Student Union was under the same premise. I was dealing with a lot of hate and the administration was doing nothing. But I at least had supportive parents, parents that wouldn't kick me out or abuse me if they found out my sexuality. So even though administration at my school and whatever was pretty not, they were uh, pretty lackluster in doing anything, I decided that I needed to be that person for other people because other people are experiencing what I'm experiencing. 
but they can't go home and have parents defend them. Um, so that's why I even started the Queer Student Union. And now that's been amplified times like a thousand. And I'm able to be that for not just people at my school, but people across the country, which I think is really beautiful. Well, it is. And thank you for doing that. We're going to show an excerpt of you testifying before your state legislature against this so-called don't say gay bill. But first, do you want to explain what this bill is and what it does? Yeah, so House Bill 1557, also known as the Parental Rights and Education Act, also known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. I mean, what it is is an attack on queer people. That's what it is. But it parades itself as creating more transparency between the school districts and the parents. And, and the issue with it is it has a line that says it prohibits classroom discussion of gender identity and sexuality between the ages of kindergarten and third grade or through the 12th grade in a manner deemed inappropriate. The vague wording basically opens up this wormhole for parents to persecute teachers for any discussion about anything related to the queer community if they think that it's inappropriate. And the bill also allows the district to, or allows the commissioner of education, sorry, to appoint a special magistrate, which would fast track the process of, um, the process of these decisions of if something is inappropriate or not. And the commissioner of education is appointed by Ron DeSantis who has called this an anti-grooming bill. So basically- He's called it an anti-grooming bill. Almost yeah. wow. equating uh, uh, being gay or trans with being a pedophile. Equating gender identity and sexuality, which encompasses way more than just sex. You know, they're saying, oh, these people are grooming kids, whatever. No, um, having vital conversations about the existence of queer people is, is so different from grooming. Um, but this is like an age old stereotype that has been used to hurt, kill, um, and, and damage the queer community for centuries. So yeah. it's not shocking. It's upsetting though. So that's just fascinating. Let's keep talking about this, but first let's look at a little bit of the testimony that you gave on February the 28th. I've known that I was gay and non-binary before I even knew that the queer community existed since before kindergarten. Um, I've heard different members of the legislature say something along the lines of parents know what's best for their kids. When it comes to the queer community, that is not true. If parents know what's best for their kids, why did my best friend get kicked out of his house and have to live with me? Why is 40% of the homeless youth queer while only making up 5% of the general population? Why do so many kids get abused for their sexuality and gender identity? A lot of, a lot of you have spoken about wanting parents to know or have the ability to know what the discussion is going on in the classroom regarding queer children. Um, if for some reason a queer kid comes out to a teacher and it turns into a discussion and the parents have the right to know that, that endangers us when we're already in danger. So I ask you to please vote no on House Bill 1557 because as a queer minor, as a queer child with a younger gay sibling, I know that this will endanger people like me and people like my friends. So please vote no. So then on March 7th, um, you and your friend, um, I think her name is Maddie, you yeah. held a huge walkout at your school. We have a clip of some of that and I think you're holding a, a, bull, a bullhorn in white and there was just an ocean of students protesting this, and that must have made you feel really, really proud. It really did. This is my first year at Winter Park High School, and throughout the first semester, I'd experienced a lot of discrimination and a lot of hatred. Um, I talked about it in my op-ed, but there was a situation where I almost got beat up at a Halloween party, and there had been situations where people had harassed me in bathrooms and taken videos of me and posted it to social media, calling me slurs. and. I could go on about the stuff that happened within just this year. So seeing that same school where all this horrible stuff had happened to me and, and, and also had happened to so many of my close friends, chant, we say gay, was, <laughs> it was really a moment. Yeah, for me. And felt, for a lot of LGBTQ students, yeah. Must have felt finally at home or welcome or that they get it. Well, it, was, it was, it was really powerful. And, um, you know, uh, 
it, we had permission to do it, but uh, the administrators wanted to shut it down pretty much right when it started, but it didn't, it didn't stop for a long time. And, and, it, and it not only gave queer people their power back, but it gave students their power back, which was, which was really good. But this is pretty exciting to see. I think your generation is going to change the world. As soon as you start voting and making a difference and kicking out these troglodytes that are in the state house that are basing rules on old fashioned oppressive laws. So good for you. Yeah, voting is so deeply important. My, my club is actually um, holding voter registration booths at uh, the lunches all of next week. Wonderful. Where you know, it's it's in Florida. You can register to vote at sixteen and then vote at eighteen. But so the well, midterms are coming up. It's so important to vote right now. Well, when we offered you the award, we were just thrilled with your activism. It didn't matter what your religion or lack of religion was. But before the show, we did ask you your views on religion, and you are pretty upfront about not being religious. Well, how do what do you think about religion, and, and how do you think it plays into these anti-gay laws? I really have hold many gripes with religion as a concept i think uh it's i mean it's a it's a human construct that has held so much political and social power for so long i mean religion the catholic church these these structures they they have created they've built these systems of oppression that oppress people like me that oppress women that oppress um, anyone who doesn't fall into man that looks like man, woman that looks like woman. For example, um, in many indigenous groups, there were five recognized genders and non-binary was a thing. And then when, when colonizers came and, and stole America, um, they brought religion with them and instilled these systems of oppression that are still held up to this day. I actually posted a TikTok yesterday, I think, Someone was saying something about how I'm trying to push immorality. So I made a video in reply to that. And I said, give me one reason why being gay or trans is immoral without using religion. And no one could give me one. That's right. So right. all of the oppression that I've faced my entire life, whether people say, oh, I, I, I'm doing it because I'm religious or whether they're not, the hatred, whether or not these people are religious, the hatred stems from ideals that come from religion. And it's literally a human construct. I was born gay, you weren't born religious. You can <laughs> choose to stop going to church. I can't choose to stop being gay. These are, they're very different, but people treat them like they're the same or that religion is somehow, I can't even wrap my head around it. It, it makes no sense to me. Um, if I was like one day, oh, I believe some absurd thing about some group of people because I believe that my like stuffed animal like told me <laughs> and spoke to me, you know, <laughs> people would be like, oh, you're crazy. And I'm like, so like, what's the difference between that and like listening to a 2000 year old book that we don't know the origins of that was written 500 years after the person it's about died? Like, <laughs> or even before that, you know, the Bible, you know, the Old Testament. I think if the, if the Bible says homosexuality is wrong, then then it's the Bible that's wrong. It's, the Bible's not the authority, and yet these people in your state house think the Bible is a higher authority than actual real human lives. It's also like written into the Constitution that religion and politics should be separate. But when I was in Tallahassee, the amount of times I saw uh, Republican legislators quote the Bible was absurd. It was absurd. I was like, this is not constitutional. Um, and the fact that we even have like, the Pledge of Allegiance, where it specifically refers to God as in a Christian God, is so absurd. Um, and then, you know, the same people that that are so deeply into this are like against, they, they were the same people who were against like the hippie movement in the 60s because they were using psychedelics and seeing another like reality or whatever. And it's like, hello, I, it's, I, I don't even, I could go on for so long about well, before we, we go for a break, I just want to follow up briefly that you said they were there were legislators there quoting the Bible. And yeah, they, like legislators like quoted the Bible. And also people when I when I testified, the people who testified in um opposition of 1557, like used facts, statistics, um, personal stories. The people who 
testified in support all quoted the bible they all someone someone straight up said god made adam and eve not adam and steve someone said that like yeah. well, like we haven't heard that it like a hundred times joke. well you're so right that there is no reason except religious reasons to oppose marriage equality or to oppose equality in in general mm -hmm. for LGBTQ. You should have brought your religious. You should have brought your stuffed animal to the hearing and said, "Here's what my animal says." <laughs> so we're, we're talking. I should have, and I'll do that next year during the 2023 <laughs> legislative session because there will be another attack against us. It's not yeah, like you're right. We're, yeah, like this is the second Parental Rights and Education Act. <laughs> they couldn't oppress us enough in the first one, so they made another <laughs> one. We're talking with courageous. LGBTQ activist Will Larkins, the 17-year-old who's become a national figurehead against Florida's notorious Don't Say Gay Bill. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Chris Calvey, and I am proud to be an out-of-the-closet atheist. I'm Chris, and I may look like Jesus, but I'm an atheist. And you know, atheists are sometimes accused of leading lives that are cold and bleak and meaningless, but that's not the way I see it. To me, I don't believe that there's an afterlife. And that realization that this might be the only chance we have makes my life feel incredibly important every day. Also, knowing that help is not going to come from above imparts on me a profound sense of urgency to work together to solve the world's problems and alleviate human suffering. That's why my purpose in life is to try and leave planet Earth a little bit better than it was the way I found it. I'm a graduate student, I'm studying microbiology, and I'm trying to develop renewable biofuels before it's too late. We're talking with the Freedom From Religion Foundation's 2022 Katherine Ferringer Student Activist Awardee, Florida high school student Will Larkins who testified at his legislature against the Don't Say Gay Bill and who led a major school walkout. And he wrote a piece titled, Don't Say Gay Bill Will Hurt Teens Like Me that appeared in the New York Times recently. So, Will, you started to talk about uh, an experience that happened last Halloween and you wrote about that in the New York Times op-ed. But it was not only about the bullying, but then about what happened afterward that has real relevance about this bill. Could you tell us a little more about that? I will. Um, yeah, so I was invited to this Halloween party. And, you know, before quarantine, I had been, I think, in freshman year. So this was going to be my first, like, high school party. Um, so I was very excited. And I was going with a group of friends who were all queer and, and diverse in skin color and ethnicity and you know we were invited but um our school's population is not the most accepting so we walked into this party and at first it was fine but i think maybe 10 minutes in um i had a group of guys surround me um screaming slurs at me the f slur the n-word um telling me to f kids and f animals which you know, that ties back to Ron DeSantis in the Florida legislature calling queer people groomers. Yeah. Um, because that's literally like, this is where, this is where it affects us. Like, this is where the rhetoric is harming people like me. But um, anyways, uh, yeah, it was really scary. And uh, they were screaming and I was uh, just kind of shocked. And I was just standing there and I didn't know what to do. And I, I probably should have run away, but 
I didn't, I didn't know what to do in the moment. And then um, a guy came out of the crowd and he came up to me and he was like, if you and your friends don't leave right now, we're going to be the out of you. And I was like, oh, okay. So this is serious. I have to leave. And we left. And it was, it was really scary. And it, it didn't really hit me until the next, the Monday after that, I was in seventh period and it just like, I was like, whoa, like that happened. And it was, it was really shocking. And then the next day in first period, I went to the bathroom and had a group of guys come up to me and be like, watch out we're homophobic like be careful and like laughing at me like while I was like trying to go to the bathroom I brought all of this to my school administration they told me there was nothing they could do and in fact when I posted a video of this happening they called my parents and uh and told them that I was endangering students by putting their name out on the internet which is hilarious but, but then didn't you get some sympathy from one of your your teachers I did a, lo a lot had happened that month like not just that and not just the bathroom incident like there had been a multitude of homophobic incidents. And also um, uh, earlier that month, I was dating this guy, but we couldn't be together because his uh, dad threatened to kill us. Wow. So wow. yeah, homophobia on homophobia on homophobia. Uh -huh. So I broke down crying about all of it in sometime in November in my English teacher's classroom. And she um, comforted me and, and I, and I had support from other teachers, like, but she, but she was able to sort of relate this back to her experience growing up and and told me gave, gave me advice based on her own actual experience and it was such a an important moment for me and what's frightening is had the don't say gay bill been in law she could have been putting herself in harm's way that's right. That's exactly the kind of thing that teachers won't be able to do now that this law has been passed. Yeah. And and obviously, you know, not everyone's going to listen to this law. Um, I'm all for breaking laws if it's 1557. Um, but there will be other situations. It's not going to just be like this. So, like, I'm sure had the Don't Say Gay Bill been in law in place, she still would have talked to me because we had a close relationship. But there's so many situations where you don't have a close relationship with your teacher, but you just need someone to be there for you and you they won't be able to because they would be putting themselves at risk of a lawsuit for being there for kids who are getting bullied. That's right. We want to clarify that, that this law says student uh, parents can, can sue teachers. And it goes through a special magistrate appointed by the commissioner of education who's appointed by the governor who's homophobic. So could the state tell uh, teachers not to inform their students that the earth is round because there might be some religious parents who think the earth is flat? I mean, really, how far does this go? to that point. <laughs> how far does this go about offending the parents' feelings, you know? But Oh, I know. Uh, I want to ask, um, in your piece that you wrote for the New York Times, you said, from an early age, I knew I was different. How did you feel and how did you know you were different and, and how were you treated because of that? Literally in kindergarten, like I said, I, I, I kind of misspoke in my um, in my testimony. I said before kindergarten, but I meant at kindergarten. That's sort of when I started to realize that I was different. I mean, I was like surrounded with people and I, my interests were the interests of girls. And I, I went to a small school, so there was the boys group and the girls group, and that was it. It wasn't like there weren't cliques or anything. It was the girls and the guys, and I didn't fit into either. So it led to a lot of self-hatred and a lot of, why am I like this? I'm the only one I know like this. There's no one else like me. I'm broken, that sort of thing. And then a lot of a lot of just, uh, a lot of just bullying from kids because they didn't understand, and I believed them because I didn't understand, and and. It would have made a world of difference if someone had said at any point until seventh grade, hey, there's a whole community of people like this and you're not the only one and it's okay. And you write about that in your piece that you finally, uh, somebody before seventh grade finally kind of opened your eyes. They, she asked you, are you, are you gay or are you, are you LGBTQ? And then you started to accept yourself. But you also in your New York Times piece point about the high suicide rate or attempts of suicide disproportionately by LGBTQ youth and and how studies have shown that if they get to talk about it in school and learn about it, it makes a huge difference. Do you want to elaborate a bit about that? Well, I think it, it there's two different reasons it makes a difference. 
Um, one, I've heard, I've talked to so many people who grew up in religious families or non-accepting families where, and they've, they've told me just awful stories of asking, you know, their parents like, okay, so what is the LGBT, what is being gay? And, and having just awful responses in reply or, and, and I've had friends who have been like severely abused for um, being guys who showed femininity at a really young age. Um, I have friends who have talked about how they used to, uh, friends and exes and people who have talked about how they've spent, how they spent hours when they were 10, 11 years old praying to God that they wouldn't turn out gay. Um, and that stems from a lack of education. If it was taught in schools that, hey, being gay is a thing, it's natural, um, it's literally scientifically proven to not be a choice, don't worry, then these kids wouldn't feel like they were a burden or that they were doing something wrong. They wouldn't have to pray to some God that they, that they wouldn't be who they are, who they were born to be. Um, and then on the other side, so, many, so much of the homophobia that I've experienced has stemmed from not understanding the queer community. Um, I also mentioned this in my article about how a lot of people have been homophobic to me simply didn't know that being gay was a choice. And, and you know, when something is a choice, then you're less likely to be empathetic towards it and towards the oppression of it. Like how I'm less likely to be empathetic towards someone who chooses to be religious and then faces persecution for their beliefs that they chose. Mm-hmm. But being gay is not a choice. I didn't choose to be like this. I didn't choose to feel physically only comfortable when I present as androgynous. But that one is- thing you have chosen t- to be, Will, is outspoken and courageous and brave. And we're just so pleased to meet you. And thank you so much for speaking out and joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Annie Laurie. It's been a real pleasure. And we want to thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.